Hi, I'm Dr. Boyce Watkins from Financial Juneteenth, and I wanted to take a second to talk about something that uh, is a very sensitive topic. Uh, it's not the kind of thing you would talk about in the workplace or, you know, when you're around your boss uh, at work, assuming you work for one of the big corporations or university or something like that. But I think it's something that we could talk about in our house, in our space. This is our space. This belongs to us. There's nobody who can stop this dialogue from occurring. Um, one of the things I want to warn you about is the uh, the importance of avoiding the necessity to feel that uh, that you need validation from white Americans in order to be a successful black person. Uh, this is something that has been with us uh, psychologically and culturally for th for hundreds of years. We have uh, because I, whites have so access to so many resources, control of most American institutions. Uh, we uh, end up feeling that if we are aligned with these institutions, if you get the big, you know, fancy job at the big corporation, or you're making lots of money and it's being paid to you by a big company, um, that that somehow makes you better, or that somehow makes you more successful than a person of color who is not part of that mainstream um, you know some examples I can think of on the biggest level might be how you have some black people who might have uh, who might consider Louis Farrakhan to be uh, less less successful than say uh, Steve Harvey or uh, Will Smith or something like that um, you know again not everybody feels that way but but you get my point my point is that sometimes we think that being around our people uh, or being uh, supported by our people means less than if you're supported by everybody. And I, and I think about that also when I think about a recent article by The Root, which is a white-owned publication, by the way. It's not a, it's not that it's not a black news website, but let's be clear, it's not owned by black people. It's owned by The Washington Post. Uh, and Henry Louis Gates, I think, is a partial owner. Um, the Root, uh, I think, listed Ta-Nehisi Coates at uh, the, the Atlantic as the most influential black person in America. Now, I think that he was influential amongst white Americans. I, I think that Ta-Nehisi did an amazing job writing a great article uh, about reparations that, that millions of people read. Uh, the Atlantic loves him because he made them so much money and they're going to pay him well. And I think that that's a wonderful thing. But uh, I think amongst African Americans, I don't think he was the most influential black person. Uh, I don't know who was. I'm not qualified to judge that. But I can certainly say that uh, that sort of being propped into a broader white owned platform space can make people get the impression that somehow you've made it, that somehow you're doing better than other people. And I saw this also happen when uh, Cornell, when Obama was elected and Cornell West was speaking up on behalf of black and brown people. And so in order to uh, squash him, the Obama administration may, helped Melissa Harris Perry get access to a big white platform, uh, mainly MSNBC, as well as um, uh, whatever that magazine she was writing for. I want to say it was Slate.com or one of the liberal publications uh, because they felt that by having her in that bigger space she could trump Cornel West and somehow people walk away with this impression that if you've been accepted by mainstream America that you are better you are better off that you're better than those who are in marginalized America now uh, I think that this applies to all of us, not just on the, the big the, the big stage but I'm talking about just in your own life uh, you know how many times have you seen somebody who who felt that a person who worked for say IBM, or, or Google or Coca-Cola, who was an executive who made a few hundred thousand dollars a year, how often would you say that people would pick that person to be more successful than that black entrepreneur who starts his own business, who's only pulling in, let's say, 70000 a year, but he owns his own stuff? He has the dignity and the freedom that you really aren't going to get at a Coca at a Coca Cola or at an IBM. He can speak his mind. He gets to be his own man. He owns something. Uh, I, I think that those uh, attributes have to be valued in our community because part of the reason that we're trapped as a people, part of the reason that we're left behind economically, is because we are accustomed to feeling that in order to be successful, we have to beg white folks for our validation. For many black people, their your validation comes through how much money you make. So, and since whites control most of the money, then that effectively means that you're dependent upon the descendants of your historical oppressor to give you the things that you need in order to feel good about who you are. So you wonder why black people have such low self-esteem. It's because white people aren't giving us jobs like that. They aren't giving us opportunities like that. They're not going to give away their resources like that. And here's another thing that you really got to understand, and this is very, very important too. I talked about uh, this issue with uh, 
another independent black entrepreneur who's doing extremely well. He and his wife are making hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, and, 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 you know, and it's funny because we were joking about how there were some uh, mainstream uh, organizations, mainstream individuals who won't work with us because we're black not because we're bad or criminal or hurting people but because we we're we're doing things that are very black and their white readers or their white uh customers get offended so we talked about this and uh and and one of the things that we both agreed on that we we were thinking was we said you know black people have to learn uh that you're gonna have to fight for your equality if you want equality you're gonna have to fight for it white people will never give you equality Understand this, white people don't look at themselves, most white Americans don't look at their own lives and say, oh, I'm doing so well, I've got all these extra millions of dollars, and I'm just going to give it to black people, I want to give them reparations, I want to give them affirmative action, I'm going to give them all these other things, so they can have the jobs that, that I feel like I deserve to have for myself and for my family. No, when you beg somebody for something, you don't get what they need. You're going to get what they don't need. You're going to get what they have left over after they take all the good shit. Excuse my French. I said shit again. I didn't mean to do that. You're going to get what they leave you after they've taken what they feel that they want and need. So one of the things that I think that we have to really, really grow out of, and I think this is something that we uh, became addicted to when, when we saw how successful the civil rights movement was in terms of getting laws changed and, and achieving integration, we forgot the other side of Dr. Dr. King's coin. We forgot to listen to the Malcolm that, uh, that was inside of Dr. King, which basically said that you have to fight for economic equality and you have to fight by basically competing for scarce resources. You've got to go in the battle ready to compete. The white man ain't going to feel sorry for you. He don't care that you ain't got a job. He does not care that you can't feed your kids. And and really, the truth is, at the end of the day, does he have an obligation to care more about you than you care about yourself? That's just a fact. So here's where I'm going with this. My point is that in order to get true equality, in order to get ahead, you can't ask somebody to give that to you. They're never going to do that. Uh, You have to compete for that. And in order for you to compete for that, when you're competing for something that the other party deems to be valuable, you must be prepared for the fact that they ain't going to like you when you're competing with them. How often would you ever want to befriend and give something away to somebody who's trying to take food out of your kids' mouths, who's trying to take money from you that you feel like you, you deserve? You might have some extra, but that's your money. You're not going to give that away. You're going to fight them tooth and nail. And the idea that we think we can beg our way to equality is absolutely sick. And the idea that we are so afraid of white people disliking us that we're scared to truly compete, we're scared to tell the truth, we're scared to fight for what we really know that we deserve, that that is, is one of the things that, that continuously holds us back. It makes no sense for us to be afraid to con, con, to come together as black people, to talk to each other as black people, to talk about black issues publicly, to move forward in terms of building our businesses, to speak about racial inequality. It, it, it makes no sense that we're afraid to do that because we don't want to offend white people. Well, the last time I checked, uh, you can compare it to being in a basketball game. Last time I checked, even if you're down by 30 points in the game, you can't beg the other team to give you points. They may give you a couple points so that you lose by 20 instead of by 40, but they're not going to give you enough points to make the the, the score even. They're not going to give you enough points to win the game. You're going to have to take those points. So the bottom line here, and this is where where my final point is on this, don't look for white people to to validate you. Um, It doesn't mean you have to be mean. You treat everybody with dignity and respect as long as they respect you back. If they disrespect you, then at that point, if you feel that the situation calls for it, then it may that may be a scenario where you have to disrespect them back, um, and 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 realize that there, there's going to come a point in time where you where there's going to be a conflict of interest, where you're going to realize that by standing up for your people, you're going to have people that are going to label you a bad Negro. They're going to label you as an angry black woman. They're going to tell you that you you would be you would get ahead in the company if you didn't learn how to be if you if you wouldn't weren't so angry all the time if you'd learn how to just play the game. And I think that's okay. I mean, people can make their choice to play the game if they want to. I don't I don't play those games uh, because I found that the price that I paid spiritually, psychologically, and otherwise was just too high. Um, I met a brother who was 50 years old who told me that. Uh, the stress of trying to fit into a box in a big white corporation was so great on him that he almost died. He became uh, depressed. 
His testosterone level had dropped to almost nothing to the point where he couldn't even get out of bed. Um, he was suicidal. Um, he ended up taking a bunch of antidepressant medications. He had a bowl of medications this big that he was taking just to keep it together. Uh, when I saw that and I listened to him, his story, I said, I don't want that to be me. That's not going to be me because I'm not a bad person. I treat people well and I'll be damned if I'm going to let you treat me like I'm a nigga just because you don't like the color of my skin or just because you don't like where I come from or just because you don't respect the people that I represent. I'm not going to live that life. So what I say to you is that if you don't want to live that life, don't be afraid. You can survive. Learn how to have your own business. Learn how to create multiple streams of income. Save your money. Don't get addicted to excessive consumerism because that's how they get you hooked. You get the big house and the fancy car and the big mortgage and all the debt. And then you need the corporate overseer to take care of you so that you can have all the things that you've been buying and spending your money on so that you can somehow feel like you're somebody. Well, I'm going to go back to old school. I'm going to go back to what Jesse Jackson told us a long time ago. It's simple, but it's effective. You are somebody. You could be staying. I don't care if you're a vice president of this or a CEO of that or or if you, uh, you, you got a PhD, MD, JD, and all these other letters behind your name that make you feel like you're better than other people. It does not matter. You can strip all that away, put you in the middle of the street, butt naked without a, without a dollar in your pocket, and you are somebody. You are somebody not because some white man came and patted you on the head and validated you. You are somebody because you were born that way. God made you into somebody. And don't let anybody ever tell you any different. And you're going to have to lean on that when you take a stand for your people. Because you can't abandon your people for the sake of the dollar bill. You got too many Negroes out here cooning for cash and it's killing our community. If, if When you run into that situation where they label you a bad Negro because you took a stand for your people, you tell them to go to hell because you are somebody and you're going to be all right. That's all I want to tell you. I, I, well, I'm Dr. Boyce Watkins from Your Black World. Please take care. God bless. I'm gone.